Well, good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nate Sandhat, the president of Wofford College, and I'm pleased on behalf of the Wofford community to welcome you this evening to the first edition of Voices in American Art, brought to us by the Johnson Collection. We're fortunate to have the Johnson Collection based in Spartanburg, as it's a large, comprehensive, and important repository of Southern art that offers a unique opportunity to understand the ways that the South has participated in the larger dialogue of American art. Our students are fortunate to be able to participate in projects and work with this important collection. To introduce tonight's speaker is one of the benefactors of the collection, Mrs. Suzanne P. Susu Johnson. Susu and her husband George, a 1964 Wofford graduate, are among the most significant philanthropists to live and to have lived in this region. Susu, a devoted alumna of Converse College, is passionate about enhancing the educational environment civic engagement and cultural vibrancy of this community, this state, and this region. And she's done so through numerous volunteer involvement, holding elected office, and with crucially important behind the scenes leadership. The Johnsons have been involved in gathering this wonderful collection of Southern art for just over a decade, and have generously shared significant pieces of it throughout the community. Prema, my wife, and I are proud to claim George and Susu among our newest friends and are thrilled that the collection has shared some beautiful pieces with the college and housed them in the president's home. After tonight's lecture, we would be pleased to have all of you join us for a reception in our home just down the walk and enjoy the company of friends, colleagues, and to enjoy the collection at the college. Now, join me in welcoming and expressing profound appreciation to Susu Johnson, who will introduce our speaker. Susu.
highlighting the old masters from Europe. Corbin gave uh, a space for these young developing artists to show their work. And as his private collection grew in size and stature, he determined to create a national museum in Washington, D.C. It predated the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It predated the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. In transforming his wealth into culture, Corcoran set an example as a collector and as a, a philanthropist. By considering his collection's focus on American art, he proved himself a passionate, a patriot as well. In opening his collection to the public, and endowing it for the future. He revealed a deep generosity and far-reaching vision. There's a, a quote I have that he wrote to his children and grandchildren about his mission here. He said, blessed by kind providence with larger possessions than commonly fall to the lot of man, I have regarded them his fortune as a sacred trust for the benefit of knowledge and truth. To put it simply, W.W. W. Corcoran was a grateful man who shared well. And tonight we are privileged to have in our midst Sarah Cash, who steers this uh, fabulous museum and its collection years after Corcoran left us. So I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Sarah Cash. Uh, around Washington, D.C., uh, but 
In my background, I have some southern United States. My father and was from Winston-Salem. So on my father's side, I, I have uh, part of this, I have the South in my blood, so I hope you'll welcome me here. And, and, and consider that when I talk about works of art from the wonderful Johnson collection, about which, I, as I said, I've learned a lot. Next, please. So I thought I would start with this wonderful image, which I was delighted to find was the landing image on the Johnson Collection website, because this, uh, briefly stated, gives you an idea of what I saw when I woke up this morning on my way to the airport to fly here, because I live in Arlington, Virginia, and this beautiful, wonderful view of Washington from Arlington by John Ross Key is a painting, dare I say, I covet. <laughs> And is a is a gorgeous view. Also, this is almost exactly the site near Arlington Cemetery, near the Iwo Jima Memorial, where my husband and my son and I watch the Fourth of July fireworks every year. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a sort of little transition into my remarks. I've been thinking a lot about uh, various things as I've been researching the Johnson Collection and preparing for my remarks tonight. One of them, uh, as you'll see and hear, I hope, is a. a about the synergies between the collection here in Spartanburg and the Corcoran's collection, and indeed William Wilson Corcoran's original collection that Susu referred to. I've also, and in, this, in my slides, I've identified, of course, one works from the Johnson collection and one works from the Corcoran, and I've, I've also noted when works were in the original collection of William Wilson Corcoran, which of course is not the only, or not the only works of art that comprise my museum. They are the core collection, on which we have built in the last uh, over 150 years, approximately. I was really intrigued to see that uh, the Johnson Collection's mission is described as a private collection for public good, and that, of course, there is a strong, strong interest in sharing this collection and educating with it and around it, uh, doing good for the community in terms of sharing this collection and scholarship which is very much, interestingly, something that William Wilson Corcoran, my museum's founder, believed in. So there are not only synergies of, between the, the collections, but synergies between the, the mission of, of the Johnson Collection and the Corcoran Gallery. In fact, the words encouraging American genius that were on the title slide were the words in the Corcoran's charter in 1869, words put in that charter by William Wilson Corcoran, our founder who was very interested in giving back to his home city, Washington, D.C., a place that he loved. And I'll say more about that in a moment. So this idea of pride of place and sense of uh, gratefulness to, to one's community and giving back to one's community is something, of course, that you all see more than I do because you live here uh, as far as the Johnsons and their collection are concerned. But it certainly is something that was operating in Mr. Corcoran's lifetime. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, I thought I would share with you uh, a little bit uh, by way of introduction the history of the Corcoran that Susu uh, alluded to. So, Eve, next, please. And, and actually, yes, good, it's a good place to be. So, uh, as I said, like the Johnson the Collection, the Corcoran began actually as a private collection in Washington, D.C., for the public good. And Mr. Corcoran is very enthusiastic about education, art education, the Corcoran Gallery of Art, and this is our, our present home, our future home, our beautiful 1897 Beaux Arts building, designed by James Flagg, that opened in 1897. It was not the first home of the Corcoran, but uh, it houses not only the Corcoran Gallery of Art, where I'm a curator, but also the Corcoran College of Art and Design, which is a wonderful college of undergraduate and graduate education for art and design students with uh, many different types of degrees in art and design and art education, uh, many, many different aspects to, to the institution. The Corcoran was founded, uh, as Susie mentioned, very early on in our country's history. It's actually the oldest, what I call, purpose-built art museum in the United States. Founded in 1869 uh, with the personal art holdings of Washington banker and philanthropist William Wilson Corcoran. Uh, and the first, as I mentioned, the first country, country's first cultural institution to be established 
expressly as an art museum. It was the first gift of an art museum of substantial size to the American public by a single individual. And, and as such, really established a paradigm for philanthropy in the young nation. Its successful charter was testament to the vision, perseverance, and generosity of its namesake, particularly in a city relative uh, to, say, New York City, Boston, or Philadelphia, was something of a cultural backwater in the middle of the 19th century. Other institutions were not established expressly as art museums. Next. For example, the Pennsylvania Academy, Academy of Fine Arts was founded in 1805 to acquire art and to educate artists, but unlike the Corcoran, did not begin with a collection or a museum building. The slides that you're seeing on the screen uh, at the bottom, you see students working from plaster casts in that wonderful period of photograph, but at the top you see photographs of the beautiful uh, 1876 Frank Furness building that now houses the Pennsylvania Academy. However, that was not the first uh, building that, that has that institution, which, as I mentioned, started as an art school without a collection, not really as a museum. Next, what is today the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art was founded in 1842 as an Athenaeum. You see on the left and on the right sides of the wonderful Boston Athenaeum, which, again, was founded as an Athenaeum, more of a place with a library, with a few works of art and sculptures and portraits around, a place for learning and edification, but not really as an art museum. Next, the founding of the Corcoran was soon followed by that of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1870. Here's the Met's wonderful original building. Uh, actually, not the original, yes, the original building, which you can still see the facade of when you go uh, to the Met in a, in a, a particular courtyard there. Founded in 1870, opened in 1872, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston opened in 1876. Next, uh, William Wilson Corcoran was, uh, actually, go to the next, please, was, we'll come back to Mr. Corcoran. He was the son of Thomas Corcoran and Hannah Lemon Corcoran. Uh, sorry, you can, next, yeah, you can stay there. Uh, uh, it was the son of, of the Corcorans, who were Irish immigrants. Mr. Corcoran was born in Georgetown, then uh, at the time of his birth, 1798, was not part of Washington, D.C. And uh, back Eve, to William Wilson Corcoran, he, he started off in a variety of trades in Georgetown, including, including the leather tannery of his uncle. And he kind of worked his way up and eventually began to, uh, to work as a banker in Washington, D.C. Again, it seems like a different place at that time it was, now it's the same city. As a banker, Mr. Corcoran joined forces with the Baltimore banker George Riggs uh, to form Corcoran and Riggs Bank, later Riggs Bank, now PNC Bank. Uh, but Corcoran and Riggs' biggest triumph occurred in 1848 when Mr. Corcoran traveled to Europe to sell United States bonds to finance the Mexican-American War, the market for those bonds in the U.S. having declined. The sale made the partners, Corcoran and Riggs, a very wealthy men, and established Corcoran as the leading international banker in the U.S. He retired from business uh, in 1854, at about age 56, dare I say, very close to my age right now. I will not be retiring anytime soon, <laughs> I'm not a banker, uh, as some of the students this afternoon heard about um, working as a curator, and certainly don't make as much money as a banker, but I dare say, have a lot of fun. Uh, next, Mr. Corcoran, uh, and the next, thank you. Mr. Corcoran opened his home, which you see in this slide, both this wonderful image of him in, the, in his library on the right, and the um, exterior of his Italianate style building. His home was directly across Lafayette Park from the White House. Uh, this was certainly by design. Mr. Corcoran was very interested in getting attention, political attention and social attention. And he bought, actually, Daniel Webster's house, this house that you see on the screen, and moved into it. And I think he was delighted at its uh, very prominent location in Washington. He opened his house uh, once he started collecting art in about, uh, in about 1850. Opened his house about twice a week for viewing. So he, from the very beginning, was a private collector with a very public mission to share his art with the Washington public. Next, please. He was very interested in collecting uh, European art on the advice of friends, business associates, and political allies, or with them acting as his agents. 
Uh, in fact, the South Carolinian statesman Thomas G. Clemson, yes, you know, founder of the same state university, just very nearby, served as the U.S. Uh, charge d'affaires in Belgium in the 1840s, and Mr. Clemson greatly influenced Mr. Corcoran's taste for contemporary Belgian painters. Those works sadly are now lost, but they inspired Mr. Corcoran to uh, have forays into collecting European art, such as the work by Anton Raphael Mengs on the left screen, very, very large painting, and uh, called The Adoration of the Shepherds. And it was about this time that Mr. Corcoran was collecting some European art, but also quite a bit of European art, like the Huntington painting on the right, at a time when it was not very common for American collectors and philanthropists to patronize American artists. This is something quite new. Many of Mr. Corcoran's contemporaries and predecessors as collectors were looking much more to Europe. Mr. Corcoran, as I said, did collect European art, but began really to specialize in collecting American art next in the form of works by, uh, by his contemporaries, artists of the Hudson River School, like Thomas Dowdy, whose uh, beautiful landscape of the Hudson River you see on the left in the Corcoran's collection that I show next to a wonderful work from the Johnson Collection of Live Oaks in South Carolina, clearly a very different subject, a very different geography in terms of landscape painting, uh, close in date, about eight years apart, but both paintings most definitely done, executed in the spirit of romanticism uh, of the 19th century, which of course has, has informed and defined so much of the Johnson Collection, and certainly was a great uh, driver in the works of art that Mr. Corcoran collected next. One of Mr. Corcoran's prized uh, possessions, one of the greatest works of art that he collected, and I do call it a work of art because it's a work of art in two canvases. It really is a cycle of two canvases by Thomas Cole, The Departure and Return from 1837, was, was in Mr. Corcoran's original collection, which uh, shows if you can make it out uh, on the left, a soldier departing uh, for, for battle in the morning, in the springtime, everything is great. And the pendant canvas on the right is, uh, the viewpoint is turned 360 degrees. You can see the sort of, uh, the architecture, or the, uh, I don't know about laser pointer, but the, the sculpture, oh, thank you. That's the architecture and the sculpture at the far left of the painting. Uh, anyway, the view is turned 360 degrees, and all of a sudden, in the return of the soldier, who is returning to the churchyard, injured or dead, there are, there are blasted trees, it's fall, it's evening, everything is the opposite of the, the departure, in the very much uh, wonderfully didactic 19th century mode, very romantic mode, that uh, greatly appealed to Mr. Corcoran. And again, he's one of the earliest collectors of this type of work. I should say, pause and say uh, here, before I talk about these paintings, which are really interesting, Mr. Corcoran was um, a little bit more about his history. He greatly believed in giving back to his community, to giving to his country and to his city, his native city, Washington, D.C. He felt that they, uh, especially Washington, had done so much for him. And it was in the, in the guise, in the mode of a true 19th century patriot that, uh, and philanthropist that he wanted to give back to his city. In addition to Hudson River School painting, Mr. Corcoran also collected the works by uh, his contemporaries who were genre painters or, or painters of scenes of everyday life, uh, like William Tiley Granny, who's, who's seen you see on the left, and like, like Frank, well, excuse me, Frank Blackwell Mayer, whose leisure and labor you see on the right next. And the mayor, I think, is a particularly interesting painting to think about in the context of uh, American art of the South. Um, although mayor was, mayor was born in Baltimore and studied art there, and at first glance, this painting is very much a simple record of a rural blacksmith at work. Yet the painting may also be read as a morality tale. You notice the Thomas Cole paintings, they're very much about um, a morality tale. They're very much, a, there's a moral to the story. Uh, in the departure and the return. Same is true here. Uh, this morality tale addresses both the virtue of hard work and the transient nature of life. 
Later contrast the rugged, industrious blacksmith you see at the left, stooped over his work, with the elegantly attired squire passing, uh, excuse me, passively standing by. The poster to the right of the young gentleman uh, on the barn door there, uh, which depicts a running man with a scythe in hand and the misspelled text, Stop Thief, that is T-H-E-I-F, may be interpreted as a warning that time is precious and not to be wasted. Some scholars actually interpret this painting as an expression of northern antipathy toward the land gentry of the south. The live greyhound that accompanies the gentleman evokes one of the idle pursuits of the southern aristocracy during this period, the breeding of animals for sport and show. During the Civil War, the Greyhound would be used as one of the symbols of the Confederacy in anti-Southern political satires. It's a really fascinating painting with so much, uh, so much richness there. Other genre paintings or scenes of everyday life that Mr. Corcoran collected, including it included this uh, wonderful Seth Eastman painting of ball play among the Sioux and the John McStanley painting you see on the right called The Trappers, a somewhat enigmatic painting of these, these fur trappers uh, uh, in an interior, and one that um, has engendered quite a bit of research in recent scholarship. Again, in Mr. Corcoran's collection, original collection, I should say. I don't lose any wires by turning this way, because I feel like, there, it's a little better. Um, so, Mr. Corcoran, uh, can we have the next, Steve, please? Uh, one of the, the, probably the signature painting in the Corcoran's collection, and as many of you know, students of American art know, one of the most important paintings in the history of American art is this uh, painting by Frederick, Frederick Edwin Church called Niagara from 1857. Mr. Corcoran uh, was very good friends with uh, Alexander von Humboldt, the, uh, the great 19th century scientist and naturalist, and the, uh, sorry, Mr. Corcoran probably play, played a very strong role when the, the trustees of the Corcoran in 1876 uh, tried to buy, um, sorry, Frederick Church's, another painting by Frederick Church called The Heart of the Andes, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the, the Met, uh, the, the Corcoran, Period, the person in my position was not authorized to bid, high, bid highly enough to purchase the Heart of the Andes, which is now happily in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection, and beautifully displayed. And it's, it's a story I like to tell uh, my director and my board sometimes. You know, remember when a painting comes up, comes up at auction, I need to be authorized to spend enough to get a painting. Like, I'm not showing you a slide of the Heart of the Andes, but I will say that it was a a lesson learned for the Corcoran because a few months later, when uh, the trustees had lost out on her of the Andes uh, early on in the Corcoran's history, the Corcoran and the Met were great competitors for important works like the Heart of the Andes. But just a few minutes, a few months later, the trustees of the Corcoran resolved to purchase this painting, Niagara, from uh, the John Taylor Johnston collection. Uh, and they, the trustees actually said to the curator, the person in my collection, essentially, pay what you know, pay whatever it takes, bid to whatever level it takes to get this painting, because we missed out on the great heart of the Andes. So they urged the curator, urged the expediency, quote, of getting the church at any expense within our reach. The bid was successful at a price of twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Um, Niagara made a really interesting and perhaps not quite, not necessarily coincidental purchased for the Corcoran during the country's celebration of its centennial year, 1876. Next, please. As soon as Niagara was acquired by the Corcoran, artists, and there's so much more to say about Niagara itself, a uh, very, very important picture, but as soon as uh, Niagara was acquired, artists uh, who knew church and who read one of the many hundreds of newspaper articles, literally, that were published about the acquisition of Niagara, sort of clamored to get their works into the Corcoran's collection, including Frederick Church's arch rival, Albert Bierstadt, who, when he heard about the purchase of Niagara, said, hmm, I don't have a painting in the Corcoran's collection. This Mr. Corcoran seems to have a lot of money. I think it's time to try and get a painting under his nose. So Albert Bierstadt sent this painting to Washington just a few months after the Corcoran purchased Niagara, 
And he uh, we shot some of the painting in Washington, but he had shown it in New York just a few months before under the title that you see here, Mountain Lake. Well, when, when the painting arrived at the Corcoran's doorstep uh, just a few months later in 1878, next please, it arrived with the title that you see on the screen now, Mount Corcoran. Go back, please. Mount Corcoran. Uh, <laughs> Clearly a shameless and transparent, um, but typically 19th century appeal to a collector's vanity, uh, when Bierstadt thought, you know, this is really the best way to get a painting into, the Corcoran, into Mr. Corcoran's collection. Well, Mr. Corcoran, uh, his ego was flattered. The person in my position, the curator and the board, looked at this and they said, are you, you know, are you kidding? That page just last year, that painting was shown in New York as Mountain Lake, which of course has a mountain, has a lake. Uh, we're not going to believe this guy, Bierstadt, but Mr. Corcoran, of course, as I said, his ego was flattered, and guess what? He wrote the checks <laughs> for works of art. So, uh, ego duly stroked, and he would not hear of the protest from the curator and the board, purchased this painting for the Corcoran's collection. And when the curator and the board sort of doubted the, the fact that this painting was titled Mount Corcoran, they said, you're not going to be called Mount Corcoran. Bierstadt came and he said, well, Actually, uh, uh, he, Bierstadt had actually gone to what was then called the War Department in the old executive office building across the street from the Corcoran, and he applied to fill out a form to name a mountain in the West, Mount Corcoran. <laughs> uh, just kind of the same way you can name a star today, or maybe you can't do that anymore. Uh, and he brought the map over, the form over to the Corcoran across the street, and the curator, William McLeod, in my position, said, I'm looking at this, this map, this form, and it says Mount Corcoran, but Mount Corcoran is written in by hand. It seems like sharp practice on the part of the artist. Well, despite all this protest, as I mentioned, Mr. Corcoran did write the checks. The painting ended up in his collection, in, in my museum's collection. Next, please. And because we are, because this is such an amazing story in the history of the Corcoran, when we published this book a few years ago, three years ago, uh, Niagara has been on the cover of so many books. I thought, what other museum in the world can tell a story quite like this? We must have Mount Corcoran on the cover of the book. Uh, next, please. And the book is a uh, catalog of the American Paintings Collection of Corcoran, a project I'm very proud of and worked on for a long time. It has a companion website, and you probably can't read the screenshot too well, but uh, if you go on the Corcoran's website, you will find, especially students, I encourage you to, uh, and people interested in museums and the faculty, you will find uh, all that nitty gritty information that our historians love to read as they're going to sleep, like the whole exhibition history of Niagara, back please. Um, references, uh, provenance, all of that information that makes up what we call the apparatus of the painting on which scholarship is based. So the book and the website are really companions. Next, please. Mr. Corcoran, uh, when his collection outgrew his home uh, across from the White House, commissioned James Renwick, the architect of the Smithsonian Castle and St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, to design the first uh, building that would be home to the Corcoran Gallery of Art, which is now the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian Institution. As you can see here, uh, or can interpolate, uh, the construction on the building was interrupted at the time of the Civil War. The building was taken over by the US government and made into a clothing depot. You see the Quartermaster General's office there on the left. Beautiful building based on the design of the Wings of the Louvre that Mr. Corcoran had gone to see in Paris. Mr. Corcoran, alas, was a Southern sympathizer. He decamped to Europe quite promptly at the outset of the Civil War, not to return until after the war's end, and that's when the building was taken over by the government. Next, please. And here you see, not a contemporary, but, but um, an actual photograph of the really fantastically beautiful original Corcoran Gallery of Art, which is at 17th in Pennsylvania, just catty corner from the White House, with the original cast, the ancient uh, sculpture cast collection, plaster cast collection at the upper right. And that is the frieze of the Parthenon um, around the, the, uh, the gallery at the upper right, which happily was transported to our current building in 1897 when it was built. Uh, next, please. 
one of the things that Mr. Corcoran designed, uh, or had Jane Frenwick designed for his gallery, was a special niche for Hiram Powers, the Greek slave, arguably the most important American sculpture in 19th century America, which exists in several versions. The Corcoran owns the first version of the sculpture from, uh, from 1841 to 43, and it's seen in situ at the left in the Renwick Gallery. And just, just quickly, next, uh, one of the reasons, of course, it was the most important sculpture was that it was the first publicly exhibited life-size American sculpture depicting a fully nude uh, female figure. Uh, and was, because of that and other things, was wildly popular and successful. In fact, Mr. Corcoran unveiled the sculpture on New Year's Eve in his home uh, to great acclaim in the Washington newspapers and later had a special niche built for it at the Renwick Gallery. Uh, it's, it's really an interesting sculpture in that it's, in, it's nudity, of course, you can imagine in Victorian America, really increased its notoriety. And in the middle of the 19th century, the work's importance stemmed from its relationship to recent and contemporary political events. Powers chose the subject, uh, a subject inspired by Greece's struggle for independence in the 1820s. And many literary, artistic, and critical responses to the sculpture linked it to the ongoing debate over American slavery. In fact, um, the, the sculpture itself not only garnered huge attention, but also spawned a, all of this attention in terms of American popular culture, uh, permeated popular culture, inspiring everything from miniature reproductions, half-size reproductions, bell jar reproductions, um, also, believe it or not, chewing tobacco tins, poetry, and sheet music. All of this uh, coming from the Greek slave, which is a really, really interesting sculpture. I find one of the most interesting things about it was that in 1859, William Wilson Corcoran's daughter, Louise, his only daughter, married George Eustace, a Louisiana congressman, in the Corcoran home, slides of which I showed you a little earlier, with this sculpture serving as the wedding altarpiece. <laughs> um, there's been a whole really interesting article written on this topic. Um, I should say that William Wilson Corcoran had been a slave, <coughs> slave owner. He had freed his slaves by this time. The Eustaces were a slave owning family in Louisiana. There is a lot of interesting research um, around this event, both sort of art historically and sociologically, as you can imagine. Next, please. <coughs> Corcoran's, William Wilson Corcoran's interest in education led to the founding of the Corcoran School of Art in about 1890, in the 1890s, not too long after the founding of the Corcoran Gallery of Art. And I love this image of Corcoran students, art students, uh, admiring Frederick Church's Niagara, among other treasures in, in our collection in the 1890s. Next. And just a few years later, William McLeod, the Corcoran's first curator, hosted the visit of these Native Americans um, I can never pronounce this correctly, maybe Ticarilla Apache delegates who posed in their native dress in front of the indelible icon of Manifest Destiny, which is a really amazing photograph I just love to show. Next, please. Blaine Wilson Corcoran uh, was the son of immigrants, as I said, uh, who made his fortune from scratch through various business opportunities. And so he was eager, it makes sense, I think, that he was eager to discover contemporary American artists and to support them by financing their study, purchasing their paintings, helping them find commissions, and finding studio space for them. He owned some studio, uh, artist studio buildings in Washington, D.C., and actually sort of set up this little kind of like Soho in downtown Washington for artists to have studio spaces, or now I guess you might say Chelsea or Dumbo or whatever the latest place is for artists to have studio spaces in New York. Uh, Richard Norris Brooke, the artist of the fabulous painting Pastoral Visit on the screen, was one of those artists that Corcoran supported. Uh, he had a long and successful uh, career in Washington, was active in many uh, local arts organizations, and was also vice principal of the Corcoran School of Art. And the Pastoral Visit, Pastoral Visit of course, depicts, just as the title suggests, a visit from the pastor, seen at the left, to a family who, uh, who is providing food and drink for the pastor as he sort of makes his rounds to the homes of his parishioners. And the patriarch, uh, the father of the family, is sitting with his elbow on a, on, a, on a 
cigar box. The cigar box contains the money, uh, uh, which will be given to the pastor at the close of the pastor's visit. And the, uh, the fruit wrapped in a kerchief on a bench in front of the fireplace at, right will, at the right will also be given to the pastor. And the, the, the elements of this painting, including the still life elements, are really rather remarkable. And Brooke, uh, and I, I should note, of course, the very prominent central presence of the banjo, which of course is an African-American, or an instrument that was brought to our country from Africa, so important to African-American cultural life. Well, Brooke, uh, unlike many other painters of the American painters of the 19th century, depicted his African-American subjects in a very sympathetic manner. Um, I would say, I believe, not really in a patronizing manner, really very sensitive, very individualized depictions of these people who were actually his neighbors in Warrington, Virginia. Next, please. So Richard Norris Brooke was not the only artist that Blaine Wilson Corcoran supported. Corcoran also supported uh, many artists active in something called the Washington Art Association. You, uh, many of you know well, I think, this painting by William D. Washington, The Burial of Latine um, from 1864, which I'm excited to see tomorrow in Charleston. And William D. Washington, so I was thrilled to see that this painting is in the Johnson Collection because, next, Sadly, this painting is not in the Perkins collection, but William D. Washington, artist of the painting we just saw on the screen, sold his 1854 painting, The Huguenot's Daughter, to William Wilson Corcoran. Uh, when Corcoran was supporting William D. Washington, while Washington was studying with the artist Leutze in Dusseldorf. And I couldn't find, we, we know we, the, the Huguenot's Daughter is lost in history, sadly. This, our painting by William D. Washington, Mr. Corcoran's painting, so I, I found, I was interested in what images of Huguenots would look like, and so I'm showing you an image of Molay's Huguenot. This is clearly not the Huguenot's daughter, as you can tell. Um, it is his lover. But um, I, I, I was just so sad I couldn't find an image of the Washington painting. Next, please. Uh, I mentioned that Washington was a student of Emanuel uh, Gottlieb Leutze, and here is one of the, uh, in, in Dusseldorf, Germany, Lloyds was an American artist who, who worked in Germany. This is one of the Lloyds of paintings that was in Mr. Corcoran's original collection, kind of wonderful history painting of his evening party of, of uh, Milton and Cromwell and, and other notables in this interior scene. Next, please. Uh, I mentioned that early on, the Corcoran and the Metropolitan were were rivals, really, for building their collections in the third quarter of the 19th century, or in the last quarter of the 19th century. And in 1897, the Corcoran Gallery, uh, this is the year that our Beaux-Arts building opened, the Corcoran Gallery, and after Mr. Corcoran's death, he died in 1888, uh, the, the Corcoran Gallery attempted to acquire a third Lloyds of painting for its collection. I didn't show you, I showed you one of the paintings that uh, we own, we actually own another. The Corcoran tried to buy this painting. <laughs> Emmanuel Lights this massive Washington crossing the Delaware, which even if you were not an art history student, I feel certain you might call up in your memory bank seeing this painting in an American history book from, uh, from when you were in maybe middle school <clears throat> or high school or elementary school, getting dates from 1851. The trustees at the Corcoran, sadly, were outbid in their uh, efforts to buy this painting. It seems to be history repeating itself with Frederick Church, George Innes, and Oitza. Uh, and the painting was bought, um, the, the bidder for this painting was someone named Samuel Putnam Avery, a very prominent uh, collector or, or dealer in the 19th century. Next, please. Who, interestingly, had helped Mr. Corcoran with many of his purchases, but now in a kind of turn of character or turn coat, sense, uh, decided he was not going to help Corcoran, Mr. Corcoran, he was bidding for another collector, John S. Kennedy, who immediately gave the painting, uh, Loises Crossing the Delaware, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where it now attracts, as you probably know, about a billion people a year, <laughs> because it's such an important history of uh, work and history of, of American art. Next, please. So I'll go back briefly and continue with artists uh, who, were, who were known by um, William Wilson Corcoran, and who were members of the Washington Art Association, were showed there. 
Again, trying to highlight the synergies between Mr. Corcoran's original collection and the wonderful works of art by, uh, by a Southern artist or artists who worked in the South that are in the Johnson collection, uh, showing you this great work by Charles Bird King uh, in the Johnson collection, just a wonderful image of sort of maternal love and the child with uh, holding the fruit up in the air. King was a student of Benjamin West, more about whom in, the mo in, in, the moment, in a moment a number of artists were, um, um, were students of Benjamin West, and we'll say more about that in a moment. Next, please. Charles Bird King was best known for portraits like the one you just saw on the screen, and also portraits of politicians and visiting dignitaries, but his very early still life on the left and uh, part of the screen in the Corcoran's collection is one of King's most unusual and, and intriguing works. Poor Artist Covered is seen here with its companion painting, Vanity of the Artist's Dream, in, the, in Harvard's collection. A really interesting pair of portraits with a great history. And I'll just give you a little tidbit of history about the Corcoran's painting. Next, please. Uh, Poor Artist Covered was really essentially uh, Charles Bird King's biting social critique of the lack of support for artists, uh, for the arts in America around 1815, and um, shows, as you can see, sort of all of an artist's worldly possessions, a little bread, a little water, that's a, a fur hat in the upper left-hand corner, um, uh, across um, his paint, pa painting palette, a journal of unpaid bills. They're all crowded into this small al alcove, this trompe of fool the eye paintings. Tattered books suggest the poverty of contemporary culture, in particular the large, slim volume, choice criticism of the exhibitions at Philadelphia, probably refers to the inhospitality towards artists in the city of brotherly love. Many of King's contemporaries, including Thomas Sully and Rembrandt Peel, uh, left Philadelphia because of the lack of commission, something that King was commenting on here. I should say to the students in the audience, a great an interesting discovery was recently made about this painting and Charles Bird King in particular by a student, a graduate student, I believe, who discovered that, uh, that in this painting, Charles Bird King was actually depicting, he was alluding to his alter ego, the artist named C. Palette, the C period palette, like the artist palette. And the two little business cards that you see at the bottom center uh, allude to this artist palette. One of them is a calling card, not business cards, calling card. One of them is a calling card left by a, a Mrs. Skinflint, who invites the artist C. Palette to come to her home after tea. That is, not for tea, not for dinner, but after tea, because she is so cheap. <laughs> so uh, it's really, it's a very, very rich painting, and one that I know um, historians of American uh, art in the audience know well and very rich uh, in terms of interpretation. So interesting for a still life of 1815, so early. Next slide, please. I'm showing you again uh, the image of Charles Bird King alongside one of Corcoran's most loved portrait paintings that dates from a little bit earlier than the King by Joshua Johnson, who was the first professional African American painter in this country. His really delightful painting of the McCurdy family, Mrs. McCurdy and her two daughters, has sort of wonderful um, echoes of the Charles Bird King on the left, the idea of the maternal gesture and gestures and arms linking mother and daughters, and the curve of the settee in the Johnson painting, the curve of the red um, settee in the King painting kind of uniting the figures. The idea of narrative or the little piece of fruit in the painting at the left and the strawberries at the right, presumably having been plucked from some fruit tree outside uh, and brought in, in the case of the Johnson painting, perhaps on a slightly rainy day given the presence of the, the umbrella. Johnson was a self-taught painting in Baltimore and is a really interesting sort of study, <clears throat> sociological study in the history of art in Baltimore. He lived uh, amongst his middle class white patrons in Baltimore, very close to them, and had a number of very, very important commissions from wealthy families, including families who were abolitionists. And I believe the McCurdy family was, um, Mr. McCurdy, who's not shown in this painting, was an abolitionist in Baltimore. So they're very, really interesting paintings. He was an untrained artist, as I said, and probably uh, tell that by the sort of 
lack of tension, perhaps, of the um, of muscles and uh, in the arms, lack of articulation, I suppose we would say. And I'd like to talk about the mother's left arm on our right, which if you sort of trace that arm, you find that her elbow would be way, way, that she has a really long arm <laughs> for, her, for her left arm to come up again over the shoulder of, of little Mary Jane. Uh, it is so beautifully endearing and so beautifully painted, and I'm not making fun, I'm, I'm pointing out just something that, <clears throat> that we notice when we're in the galleries. Next, please. Uh, an artist named William McLeod was also well supported by William Wilson Corcoran. He was an artist. His name is probably familiar to you. I mentioned that he was the first uh, curator of the Corcoran. There's a photo of him at the left. And he was uh, sort of a lesser known, but nonetheless important in the Washington area, painter of uh, Hudson River School-like landscapes, including the painting that you see on the right that was in Mr. Corcoran's original collection. Next, please. And I found it interesting to learn about this wonderful painting on the left by William Thompson Russell Smith, which also depicts the Potomac, albeit in a different location, this, this incredible baptism painting from 1854, not too far um, different in, in time from the cloud sunrise on the Potomac scene on the right. Smith and McLeod, interestingly, were contemporaries. I have a feeling they must have known each other. They, they might have. They were both offspring of Scottish immigrants. They both painted in this uh, uh, Hudson River School style and may well have been, uh, may well have known each other. We don't know too terribly much about William McLeod's training as an artist. Next, please. Although he did paint uh, a Civil War related painting, one that you see on the screen. And I'm very much a big uh, fan of McLeod and just delighted to know that someone who's a curator in an art museum can also be a great painter. <laughs> Next, please. So I'll turn a little bit now to an, inter an interesting South Carolina connection to the Corcoran. We're looking at the facade of my beloved building where I spend many, many hours, uh, the 1897 building of the Corcoran. And you can see on the uh, Wait, my architectural history terms are failing me, but up, up, up below the cornice, I think, the names of artists all across the front, at the top, and on the right. They are, uh, and this building was built according to William Wilson Corcoran's wishes. The artists' names are Phidias, Giotto, Giotto, Michelangelo, Raphael, Velasquez, Rembrandt, Rubens, Reynolds, Alston, and Anne. And for those of you who know your artists, you'll know that those are some. Uh, Phidias, ancient artists, artists uh, Renaissance artists, uh, and later artists, and there's only one American artist, Washington Alston, which is really very interesting. There were no Alstons in the Corcoran's collection at this time. They were acquired in the 20th century. There are definitely no Phidias's, no Giotto's, no Michelangelo's. We do own a Rembrandt that was given to us much later. And I love the idea that this is an aspirational um, selection of artists' names. Of, of works of art that were thought to be, in Mr. Corcoran's estimation, of course, among the highest standards uh, to aspire to in the history of art. But the fact that Washington Alston, South Carolina-born Washington Alston, is up there with all of those other artists is so interesting. And again, the students looking for a research topic, go for it. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, as I said, the Corcoran acquired um, some Alstons, but not they were not Mr. Corcoran's original collection. This fantastic, sensitive, beautiful sketch of a Polish Jew on the right that I show you with uh, Alston's portrait of Lady Ellery Channing on the left. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, make a great comparison. And next, please, Alston's Landscape After Sunset, uh, very early, one of the earliest romantic American landscape paintings and one of the most important early landscape paintings, also in the Corcoran's collection, also from the hand of this wonderful South Carolina artist. Next, please. I'm showing you uh, one of the Corcoran's great Benjamin West paintings, uh, simply to mention that Alston, like Charles Bird King, whose works we saw, Thomas Sully, whose works we'll see, Samuel F. B. Morris, Rembrandt Peel, were all students of Benjamin West. And uh, all of these students, whether, um, whether Southern by, um, by heritage or not, traveled to London to study with Benjamin West, known as the American Raphael, 
who was an American artist who settled in London in 18, excuse me, 1763 and uh, was a painter to King George III and founder and president of the Royal Academy of Arts. So it was very, very influential to a number of the artists we've been looking at tonight. And I just wanted to show you, I, I love this painting of Cupid stung by a bee. Um, obviously, you can see why, why he was called the American Raphael, uh, painting done in the Tondo format, very much recalling perhaps Raphael's Madonna, uh, Madonna paintings. Next, please. Thomas Sully, uh, another, another artist represented in the Johnson Collection, and here I'm showing you the Corcoran's painting of William B. Wood as Charles de Moore. Uh, Wood was a Montreal actor, stage actor, in his adopted city of Philadelphia, also home to Thomas Sully. And uh, here we're seeing the depiction of a popular place, a play called The Robbers uh, by the 18th century German playwright Friedrich Schiller. Next, please which is quite a contrast in subject matter, of course, to what Sully was, I think, rather better known for, his portraits and uh, images, I think, uh, also of his family, his lovely, lovely painting of mother and child, which I, I cannot wait to see again. And so, uh, so evocative and so, um, and so beautifully painted. And again, although different in subject matter from the Corcoran's painting, very much of the same ilk. Next, please. I chose to show you this painting because it has to do with the South uh, uh, in several ways. Rembrandt Peel's massive, massive painting, Washington.